Okay, good afternoon everybody. Hope you're having a wonderful day. So today I'm going to be talking more about set theory. So last class we had talked and introduced different definitions involving two sets. Uh, in particular, one that I had introduced was if I want to say A is equal to B, given sets A and B. Um, now remember the definition I gave you was that if I give you A is equal to B, this is if and only if A is subset of B. So that note that is a subset, not a proper subset. Um, a subset B, and B is the subset of A. So with this definition, uh, we need to think about how we can use this in order to actually prove A is equal to B. So, so commonly, there is a type of argument that's pretty common. It's called the element argument quite often. So if I want to prove A is equal to B, I'm just going to assume A and B, like above, they're just some arbitrary sets. If I want to show this, I'm just going to use the definition. It's very simple. So if I want to prove A is a subset of B, what I do is I take an arbitrary element of A, and then what I do is I show that X, this element here, belongs to B actually as well. So naturally, once I have this, so if I take any element from A and I show you that actually it's also an element of B, then I've shown you that A is a subset of B by definition. To show that A is equal to B, I just simply need to do as well the other side because of our definition here, right? So what I do is if I want to show that B is a subset of A, then I take any arbitrary element from B, call it X, and show you that it actually is an element of A. So if I do both of these, then I've shown A is equal to B. So the game plan quite often is that we have to show A is a subset of B, then that B is a subset of A. So there's going to be two parts quite often to these proofs, and it will often remind you of the idea of trying to prove a a, by, a, 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 a condition with an if and only if. So it will be two sides, uh, because remember, I have to show that I can take any element from A and show that it's actually B, and then I'm going to take any element from B and show you that it's actually an A. So just to do an example here, I'm going to give you two sets. So I'm going to give you that A is equal to the set of integers such that such that m is going to be equal to 2 times a for some integer a then i'm going to have b and b is just going to be another set of integers where n is going to be equal to 2b minus 2 just for another integer b just some integer so the general strategy is going to be this. And now imagine if I didn't tell you, tell, say I have two bins, two bins, and I knew what was in the bins, but say I didn't actually have the ability to see them. So I imagine somebody told me, oh, this, this bin over here has red balls in it, and this one has blue balls in it. So the strategy is I'm going to sure show and pick up one of these balls. And keep in mind, I don't entirely believe Possibly, it could be that there are genuinely only red balls in here. They might actually be blue balls, I'm not sure. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna pick up any one from this bin. It has to work for any one of the red balls. I pick up the red ball and I ask the question, is, so is there a way I could scratch off the paint on this and then realize that, hey look, when I touch and feel this, it's actually just a blue ball. So that's going to be oftentimes a strategy, and then we'll do it both ways. So the balls, we eventually will show that they're blue and red, but really they're just balls, right? So it doesn't really, it doesn't really do anything beyond that. So the strategy is just one direction, then the other. So I'm just going to first say what I'm going to do, then I'm going to have two parts to this. So let's start off with the first part. I'm just going to show that A is a subset of B. So, so first I'm going to, uh, I'm just going to, 
I'm going to show that A is a subset of B. So I'm going to use this element argument. So I need to first suppose that I have an arbitrary element of A. I'm just going to call it X, just to make this simple. It doesn't have to be called X, remember. It's just a variable. So I'm just going to say consider consider an arbitrarily chosen element consider an arbitrarily chosen element x in A now so I, I, I've considered the first step right That's, Pretty straightforward, but number two does not seem very clear to us, right? So what I need to do is I need to think very carefully about this. If I want to show that X is actually in B, I need to make it so that, now this is just off to the side here. This is just off to the side. This isn't a part of the proof. I need to show that that x can be written like, like something like this. 2 times some integer minus 2. Can I do that? Can I write it like that? Well, this is the great thing, is that everything has a common domain here. These are integers, right? And I know that any integer in here can be expressed like this for some a, right? Likewise, in b, I can express any integer like this for some integer b. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to solve the following. So all I have to do is I can really just try writing out. Just remember, this is just off to the side. I still haven't yet really told you what I'm supposed to do. I'm just trying to come up with ideas here. So I'm going to take 2a, and I'm just going to make it equal to 2b minus 2. Now, I would like to have something that looks like a b, so that I can get something that looks like this form right here. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to solve for b. So I'm, try, I'm trying to look for, look for something that says something in terms of b. So if I have this, I can easily rewrite this as b. Now remember, if I just want b, right, I can just add 2 to both sides of this equation. So I can take that, and then I'm going to divide it by 2, so I end up with just b on one side. So I end up with b is equal to 2 times a plus 2 divided by 2. So I'm just going to take that. So now I have b is equal to this. And I can simplify this ever so slightly. And then I end up with just simply, well, b, I remember I just have b here, right? b can be just simply written as, remember, this is a 2. That's a 2. It's being divided by 2. That's a common factor here. So I end up with a plus 1. So now I have b is equal to a plus 1. Now this gives me a nice thing to work with. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to use this idea I have. Remember, this is not a part of the proof. I'm just giving you this to give you the intuition of why exactly I'm going to pick the one I'm going to do. So I'm just going to write down what exactly I'm going to do. Remember, I have to invoke the definition of a, and then I want to take that element and show that's actually in B as well, right? So, by the definition of A, there is, there is integer A, right? Such that, such that x is equal to 2a. Remember, that's just the definition. It's right over here. It's right over here. Nothing. I'm not pulling out any black magic here. This is just the definition. So now 
I'm just going to pull out what I did over here on the side, and I'm just going to see what I can do with this. So I'm going to say, let b equal a plus 1. Remember, b is an integer. b is, in, for, in fact, an integer because first, a is an integer. And also, I'm adding it to 1, which means it's still integer under closure. So, that being said, uh, I have this right here. Let this. Um, so just remember, this b is an integer. Notice that. So all I'm going to do is I'm just going to write down what this is over here. Because remember, that's really the form I'm looking for. So I'm going to take, notice that, 2b minus 2 is equal to 2 times. Now notice that this is just, this looks like something I could factor, right? So I have 2 times, now remember, I can rewrite this a little bit, right? So notice I have this factor of 2 here, so I'm just going to pull out everything here. Actually, now let's, let's try something else. Let's do this. See, this is the thing. When you're writing out a proof, you always kind of think about this carefully. You notice how I went one step a little ahead. There's an easier way of doing this. That way it probably wouldn't have worked very well. Here's an idea. I'm just literally just going to put B in. Like this. So now I have that. Let's simplify. Well, this is just 2A plus 2 minus 2, right? Well, plus 2 minus 2, well, that's just going to end up being 2A, right? This is just 2A. And then, guess what? That's X. So now I have x is equal to 2b minus 2, which is right, sitting right here. So I've written, in fact, an element that is, so I've given you the x that fits this form. So, so let's conclude. Thus, x is in is in B. X is in B by definition. So that completes the first part of this proof. And now let's do the second part. So the second part is quite straightforward. I'm just going to use the same idea because the great thing is, is I've already set up a relationship between A and B in my scratch work. So, next we need to show B is a subset of A. So, I'm just going to consider any X in B. So now, remember, once I have something written down like this, I want to just use the definition, just like I did before, by the definition, by the definition of B, by the definition of B, there is some B. Of course, an integer such that such that two b minus two is equal to x, right? Now, remember, like I did here, I'm trying to get something that looks like the form of the other one. So I'm looking for something that looks like a 2 times an integer. Now, this is the great thing, is I already have this here. So I have b is equal to a plus 1. 
So notice that I can, here I'll just write that again. So notice that I can just rearrange this a little bit. And I end up with something that looks kind of nice, right? So what I'm going to do, let's take a look at this. I'm just going to put, I'm going to subtract 1 from both sides of this equation here. Now I'm going to get a is equal to b minus 1, right? So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to try and see if that works for us. So let a equal b minus 1. Remember, b minus 1 is in fact an integer because the difference of two integers is still an integer. Then, then, now this is the great part. Remember, I want to start off with something that's in A by definition. Actually, no, sorry. I want to show, I want to show, remember, we got to remember, always look at the definitions. So I want to take and show that anything that's in B is A, so I need to start off with something that looks like A and show you that it's in fact equal to X, because X is any arbitrary element of B. So, then 2A is equal to 2 times B minus 1. I'm just substituting in what A is in terms of B. Which, of course, if I expand this out, I end up with 2b minus 2, which, guess what? Look at this. Look at this. This is the form that we're looking for um, when it comes to the definition of b, which we already established is x. That's just x. in A by definition. Therefore, because we're done, remember I've just shown you the idea, so I've, I've shown this. Therefore, A equals B. And we're done. End of proof. So all I did was I just used the definitions. And I just used this idea of the element argument. So remember, this is all just the definitions. There's nothing special about that particular kind of argument. Remember, I'm just proving a statement like we've had in the past. So I'm going to switch gears, and we're going to talk about something else. That relates, but it's still about sets. So oftentimes in school, you may have seen something like this, but I'm going to formulate it in a bit more of a precise way. I'm sure you've probably heard or seen maybe the idea of a Venn diagram. They're used all over the place. So let's talk a little bit about Venn diagrams. So if you're wondering, um, there is a way we can talk and represent sets in a nice convenient way when we have a small number of sets. We oftentimes will like to represent them as regions that are enclosed in a shape, usually a circle or an oval. And we want to represent the sets as regions inside of a plane. If, imagine, remember, a plane is like a, piece of, a flat piece of paper. So, just to give you a heads up, so given sets A and B, I'm just going to write down what I just said, represent the sets as regions. in the blank. Just for a little bit of background, if you're wondering where the heck a Venn diagram came from, uh, this actually isn't that ancient of an idea, at least when it comes to set theory. 
This was something given by the mathematician John Venn. And this would have been around, I believe it's 1881. So I'll give you the idea. So I'm going to first show you how you could represent a subset. So here's the idea. So if I tell you A is a subset of B, there's two possibilities, right? It either could be that A is a proper subset of B, or B is equal to A. There's two possibilities, only two, only two, at least in our discussions here. Okay, so there's two possibilities. What I'm gonna do is I'm gonna represent the sets as regions in the plane. Or one could be enclosed in the other to indicate that it is contained in the other set. So if A is a subset of B, but A is a proper subset of B, then notice I have a region here that I've enclosed with a circle here. It doesn't have to be a circle, it's just a circle here. It could be an oval, it could be a rectangle. I don't care. It's just some region in the plane. So I'm going to label that A, and then this is B. This represents A is a proper subset of B. Now, if ever we're really unsure of the relationships here, oftentimes people will use this to represent for certain some subset. However, if A is equal to B, you'll notice that the region should quite literally be the same one. So it should say A is equal to B, right? Like this, so this is, this, this is A and B together. Since they're equal, I just draw one region. It's pretty straightforward, right? So you probably are familiar with this idea. So that's how you can represent that A is a subset of B. So naturally, I gotta show you what it looks like when A is not a subset of B. So remember, there's two possibilities there. One is either in it entirely, or it's equal to it, right? But when we have it's not a subset, we have to be a bit more careful. So if A is not a subset of B, we actually have three possibilities. First, if I just give you two regions like this, like this A and B, this means A is not equal to B, right? In the sense that they're literally not the same set. We'll have a term for this later. It's they're disjoint. So I'll talk about what that means later. So that's one possibility. Likewise, it could also be that A and B maybe share some common elements, but it's not really that that uh, A is a subset of B. So they kind of overlap. So we'll have to, we'll cross them like this to show that there's some element that is common between them, but they're still not the same set. The last possibility is actually just this one, but just in reverse. Remember I talked about the idea of a superset? So this means simply that A is going to be larger region that is containing B inside it. So it means that A contains all of B possibly, but obviously B is not going to be, uh, well B is a subset of A, but A is not a subset of B. So these are the three possibilities if I'm looking at this in terms of a Venn diagram. So I'm just going to give you an example using some number theoretic sets that we've talked about in the past. So there's a relationship we know that we know the set of integers is a proper subset of the set of rational numbers. Remember, because remember by definition, the set of rationals is every possible ratio or quotient. Let's talk about quotients, where the numerator is a integer and the denominator is an integer. So it has that form. So there's Every integer can be written in this fashion by just simply making the denominator equal to 1, right? Um, however, there's some ratios that will not be able to be represented. Um, likewise, 
The set of rationals is a proper subset of the real numbers. This is because there exists other numbers that are definitely not rational. Like I mentioned in my supplemental notes, and I gave you a proof for it, uh, the square root of 2 is not rational. It's an irrational number. Irrational numbers are, in fact, real numbers, but they're not, they're not rational. So we have this relationship. If I were to draw this out as a Venn diagram, I'm going to just draw some regions where the innermost set is the set of integers. The next one that's nested in is the set of rationals. And the outermost set here is the set of reals. Now, you'll notice that I keep talking about regions. And the other day, I sort of alluded to the idea that there is such a thing called the universal set, or sometimes colloquially called the universe, in the sense that it's the set of all possible sets. Usually this region described outside of here is called this. This is in fact the universe. So anything outside of this region can be a set of almost anything. <laughs> as long as it's a, it's a set, it's the set of all possible sets. Um, now, it's worth noting that if you really do not like this idea, because there's all sorts of interesting things we could talk about, about the existence of such a set, um, which is a very in-depth and interesting topic in its own right, which I do not have a time to talk about. Um, if you're not really cozy with that idea, you can always construct a superset of all of these sets that uh, simply can be the union of all of them, which I'll talk about union in a moment. Or you can talk about a set that contains all of the other ones. Um, those are typically what you'd run into in a practical situation. Uh, for example, if I had a data structure that was representing a whole set of possible keys that an all set of objects might have, this, the universe literally isn't every possible key value in the sense that I have a, a set of keys. It is usually the set of keys that I'm allowed to use. That is a whole other point. The point I'm getting at is that there is a set that's sitting kind of out here that we colloquially call you call the universe. Sometimes in more philosophical discussions, it's usually referred to as, I'm just going to write it out, read it out here. The re <laughs> just because I usually don't use this phrase, but it's a good idea, you're familiar with it. It's usually sometimes called the universe of discourse because we're talking about discourse, not in the sense that it's literally the case. It is just that it's, we're discussing it as if our sets are all within the discourse. So, where are we going to go with this? So I'm going to talk about operations on sets next, because oftentimes when we want to use sets, we have to have some operations where we can manipulate them. And the great thing is that without even telling you much about them, you're going to start seeing some parallels between things I've shown you in the past when it comes to logic. So, let's talk about operations on sets. So, operations. So, I'm just going to make sure I say that let A and B be sets. And you be the universal set. So remember, I said a little bit about the universal set or the universe. Uh, keep in mind there are ways to talk about the universal set in contexts that might be more useful in practical settings. But for me, I'm just going to assume it just is every possible set that might be out there. Um, but remember, there's ways to, if we want to talk about it within given scopes, that uh, we can constrain this notion, as I've said previously. So, here we go. So the first one I want to talk about is union. So here is the definition of union. So oftentimes when you say union, we say the union of A and B, which is denoted as a with a cup, with a cup, it looks like a cup, it looks like a U. It's not the letter U, it is a cup, B. Now, the definition of union is as follows. So, it, so A union B is an 
operation where I give in two sets, I get back a set. So, so x is a element of the universal set such that x is in A or x is in B. So that's going to be the definition. So, so if I give you this, what I'm really saying is, hey, look, you're going to put all the elements that are in A and all the elements that are in B together. If there's common elements, just, just ignore that, right? Just throw them all together, remove any duplicates, etc., etc. So if I were to represent this as a Venn diagram, just to make this a little easier to see, I'm just going to draw a box around it, just to, just to really emphasize that the universal set doesn't actually need to be like this really overly vague idea. So I'm going to put U in the corner of my box, just so you can see that it's there. So if I give you two sets, A and B, like this, where there's just some crossover, like this, by this definition, the resulting set should be everything that's in A and or everything that's in B, right? So the resulting operation should give me a set that, that gives me everything that's in the, both the sets. Naturally, you might ask, okay, well, why does this matter? Well, it's because now I've given you an operation that can give you two sets and I can combine the elements in them. So naturally, let me give you an example. Because it's nice to see the Venn diagram, it's actually nicer to see a concrete example. So let's talk about it. So here's an example. So imagine if A was the set containing numbers 1 and 2, and B is equal to the set that contains numbers 2, 3, and 4, then A union B should be, remember I look at my definition, it says, okay, if X is in A or X is in B, right? So I look at all the elements in A. So okay, so I know this set will have one and two in it, right? So one and two definitely will be in it. So that considers this part. Remember, it's or. That's the most important thing I want you to notice, is that it says or. Then, okay, well, likewise, I need to put everything that's in B. But notice two is already here, so I don't need the right two. Because it's just a it's a duplicate, right? So I end up with just one, two, three, four. See, it's, it's not too terribly bad. Now let's talk about another operation called intersection. So intersection. The intersection, the intersection of A and B, of A and B, which we denote with a cap or an upside down version of the cup over there. A intersection B is equal to. Or I give you some element in the universal set of my liking, where x is in A and x is in B. Notice the difference. This one involves and, this one involves or. So this one, I just kind of threw everything in to one set. This one, I only take the ones that are common between them because of this and. So if I were to draw this as a Venn diagram, imagine I have two sets that look like this. Here's A, there's B. A intersection. 
section B would be the elements that are in both sets. Because I need to make sure that x is in A and x is in B. So that means if I look at my Venn diagram, well, where are the elements that are in common between them? They're, they're right here, right? In between these two regions. So the set of elements that are produced by A intersection B is right here. So let's do an example. Actually, I can do it right here. I'm going to assume A and B are the same up there. So remember, I have 1 and 2, and then I have 2, 3, 4. Which is the common element between all of them? The number 2, right? Yes, 2 is in A, and it's in B. However, all the elements otherwise are not. So I have A intersection B is equal to the set that contains the number 2. Nice and simple. Now, because I really, really just want to show you another picture of a Venn diagram, just to really hammer in the point about intersection, I want to talk a little bit about what would happen if I gave you three sets. So given three sets, uh, I was about to write the word three. Let's just proceed. Given three sets, a1, a sub 2, a sub 3, then a1 inter a one intersection, a sub 2 intersection, a sub 3. If I give you these three sets, and say they look like this in the Venn diagram. Say if they look like this, where this one is a sub 3, this one is a sub 1, and this one is a sub 2. Notice that when I have three sets, they might overlap like this. So if I have all of them, I have to look for the elements that are in all three that are in common. Now, if it makes it easier to see what to do, introduce parentheses and look at it bit by bit. Okay, what does A1 intersection A2 look like for this Venn diagram? Okay, well, we already established it's just that over there, right? It's just this region right here. However, so, we, so just keep that in the back of your mind. It's sitting right in between here with the overlapping of their sets in terms of the regions. If I take this piece, this piece of my region, and I intersect it with A sub 3, which is this set, notice that this part right here is not common with that part, which it belongs to A sub 3. So when I take the intersection of these three sets, This little middle part right here, that is the result of intersecting or well, an intersection performed on these three sets. So if you're ever unsure what to do, just if you have given multiple sets, just add parentheses in. But remember, when you read it without parentheses, all I'm asking for is to look for the common element among all of those sets. There might be multiple elements that are common. This region might be still technically a fairly large set. It might be infinite, even. So that being said, let's proceed. So the next thing I want to define is difference, often referred to as set difference, or relative complement. So B minus. A, which you can write like a subtraction. Another way, and this is the preferred way I do it, but in this course we'll stick to this notation. Another way that it's worth noting that is used is that sometimes people will write this with a slash like this. 
So that is a division, that is not divides. This is just if I took the division sign and I reversed it. So sometimes people read this as B set minus A or B minus A or the difference of B and A. This, um, its definition is as follows. So let me give it right here. This is just simply going to be an element. X is an element of the universal set such that X is in B and X is not in A. So if you're thinking about subtraction, this notion is very similar to it, except we're talking about elements. So if I give you a set B and I go B minus A, I'm going to remove all the elements that are in B that belong to A. Now do not put anything else extra into it or anything like that. Just remove the elements that are in B that belong to A. So, just as an example of this, if I use B and A like I have over here, so I have B minus A, which if I write this out, that's 2 comma 3 comma 4, set minus 1 comma 2. I look at these two sets, okay, two, three, four. Okay, notice that in this set here, I need to remove any elements that are in here that are in there. So notice that this set has two in it. Does it have the number one in it though? No, so it doesn't matter. We can just ignore the one. However, it has a two in it. This two is also here, right? So I need to remove two from set B. And I end up with a new set. Three and four are its elements. So I'm going to draw the Venn diagram for you. Let's talk about the Venn diagram. Okay. So. So here's this Venn diagram. There's the universe. There's A. There's B. Okay, if I do B minus A, remember, I'm going to take B and I'm going to remove all the elements that are from A out of it, right? So notice that the only elements that are in common between the two is sitting right here, right? So I need to remove those from B. So the resulting set ends up being right here. It's just this, this region. Okay. So believe it or not, we only got a little bit left here to go. So let me finish that up and I'm going to define a few other things. So I'm going to define the complement. It's worth noting, I always have to say this, that this means compliment as in not, hey, you look wonderful today. I mean, this is not a compliment with an I, this is a compliment with an E. So we would denote this if I give you a set A, I would say A to the C, where C is a lowercase c, some people will also use the notation with a bar. Uh, I'm going to stick with just the C notation I have here. So its definition is just simply that I consider any element in the universal set such that X is not in A. So all I'm going to do is I'm going to take the set that doesn't actually contain anything that's from A. So, for example, if I use the A from my previous example, then 
a complement would be the universal set minus the set with numbers 1 and 2 in it. Now that isn't terribly useful, at least in its own right. Um, I'll give you a more useful example in a moment. So let me draw the Venn diagram for you. So if I give you A complement, remember I have A and B like this. Okay, remember, it's every element that is not in A. So if I look at this, remember I, I kind of gave you an idea of what this is like. It is everything but the elements in A. I get to have fun scribbling things on the board. There we go. Ah, there we go. This is this is quite the nice way to spend a uh, spend a Monday. Okay, so this is in fact the region that I get when I take the complement of A. Now, you might naturally ask, okay, well, Dan, why is this very really useful? I'm going to give you an, an example of how I can use this in a different setting. So, so I'm going to introduce the idea of interval notation to you. You may have seen this idea before. Okay, here's another example. I'm going to give you inter a definition of interval notation. Given A and B in the set of all real numbers, intervals, intervals, I'm going to denote them using interval notation. So I have A comma B with rounded parentheses is going to be the set where X is a real number such that A is less than X is less than B. So you might know this notation. The rounded parentheses tell you that it is a exclusive interval. The square brackets, as I'm going to write here, A comma B with square brackets, this is where I get X is a real number such that a is less than or equal to B. Sorry, A is less than or equal to X is less than or equal to B. So the rounded parentheses indicate exclusive intervals. The square brackets indicate inclusive intervals. So notice the change of the less than here to a less than or equal. And notice the greater than, or sorry, this other less than is also, also a less than that you're equal. So you can also write down all the combinations. So I have, so you can also have the rest written out like this. And you can get all the different combinations. I'm just doing double duty here. <laughs> so I have A is less than X is less than or equal to B for this one here, for when I have a rounded parenthesis for A and a square bracket for B. So the square bracket tells me to put it as an inequality versus just a strict inequality. So when I say inequality, I mean less than or equal in this sense versus a strict inequality, which is just less than. Okay. Likewise, I can define this. Now, just as another bit of notation, if I were to use the symbol infinity, like I have a comma infinity with rounded parentheses like this, this just means that I'm not going to cap off one of the sides of my interval. So I give you x is a real number such that x is greater than 
So notice that there is no nothing bounding x. X could be as big as you want it to be. That's what the infinity there is going to represent for us. But remember, it's rounded on the a there because, which is, means it's exclusive on a, so it cannot be equal to a. It can be bigger than it, though. Likewise, just for the sake of consistency, if I give you where you see a minus infinity on the left-hand side of my pair here, then I end up getting a set of real numbers such that x is less than or equal to b because I used a square bracket over there. But notice x can be as small as I like it to be. There's nothing stopping x from being minus 10 hundred billion a thousand. Uh, as you can see, I'm just making up numbers here. I could get, I could get quite creative here. So just as an example of this, let me write down let me write down some sets. We're going to play around with that. So I'm going to let the set A be equal to the interval. Now remember, we're talking about interval notation here in this sense. A is going to be equal to the interval minus 1, comma, 0. Now, if I write this out, this just simply means that, that I'm going to have a set of real numbers such that minus 1, remember it's exclusive because of the rounded parenthesis there, 1 is less than x, and there's a square there on the right-hand side of the 0, so that means it's less than or equal to 0. So if I have this, and I take the complement of it, let's just walk through this. Then, the complement of A is I'm just going to take everything that is not this, right? So I'm going to say that, okay, well, I'm going to have a set of real numbers. Now, you'll see what I mean by making the universal set what makes sense here. In the interval notation, everything is defined on real numbers. Thus, the universal set will also be a real number set, right? It's, it's just a set of real numbers. So, I'm going to take this. So, I'm just going to literally write out what the definition told me. It is not that that minus 1 is less than x and, and x is less than or equal to 0. So it's not this thing in parentheses. Now, remember that, that we could take De Morgan's law to this, right? We can use De Morgan's law to negate this. So it means it's going to end up from an AND statement here. I'm going to get an OR statement. And then I'm going to negate the constituent parts. So this is, of course, going to be equal to where x is a real number such that x is less than or equal to 1. Remember, this says, this says that x is strictly bigger then negative 1. So I'm just flipping the sign, but just keep in mind the way I wrote it. It's really, if you write, rewrite this the other way around, it should make complete sense. So x is less than or equal to 1, or x is what? It says x is less than or equal to 0, so I need to make it x is greater than 0. Remember, that's the, if I negate that inequality, that's what I get. And now, if I write this in terms of intervals again, this is just minus infinity, comma, negative 1 with a square bracket. Remember, the inequality here. So I got the inequality there. The or tells me I need to union the two sets. Union 
Now, it has to be bigger than zero, but there's nothing capping x to be bigger, bigger than just anything. That's a real number. So I have zero, infinity like this. Because notice that it has to be bigger than zero, but it can't be zero, right? And I have no cap in terms of the maximum size of x. And I use union because remember I said or inside of the definition up here. If it said and, you would use intersection instead of union. So that being said, let me let me. I have a little bit of time here to just talk about uh, a, a few more definitions. Then we're going to stop for today. Okay. So let me define a few things. So we're done with talking about operations. We're going to define the empty set, sometimes referred to as the null set. Okay, the empty set, as the name suggests to you, it is just a set with no elements in it. But remember, it's still a set. Literally just a set with no elements in it. We denote it quite commonly. Just in the nature of the null set. This is a, looks like a zero, but it's actually an O with a cross through it, like this. Now, I have a question for you. Is the empty set equal to, actually, let me write it down. Is the set that contains the empty set equal to the empty set? The answer, of course, is no, right? <laughs> Remember, this is a still a set that contains the empty set. However, this is just the empty set. Just like our example earlier on in the course where I gave you a set and I embedded it with other sets, the same analogy applies here because the empty set is still a set. The answer is no. They're not equal. How about, how about this? How about this? How about this? If, 
For any possible pairing of those sets, each one is disjoint, we say it's pairwise disjoint. So sometimes people say that this is also called mutually disjoint. I'm going to use the phrase pairwise disjoint here. So, so set a sub 1, a sub 2, a sub 3, and so on. I don't know how many there are. Are pairwise disjoint.
4, right there. So if I take the intersection of B sub 1 and B sub 3, I end up getting 4, which means that that's not disjoint. And by our definition, since there exists one such pair that is not disjoint, then it's not pairwise disjoint. So, of course, the answer of course, is no, it is not. Just the clarity, no, B1 and B3 contain 4. Right? Okay, so now let, let me get to the fun definition I want to get to. So, we're going to define something called a partition. So, a partition is a. Oh, hello there. Uh, it's Daniel. Um, I'm here from the future. Um, I just need to quickly insert myself in here from the future uh, just to point out uh, the definition of partition. For some reason, it was so important in my lecture to talk about the definition of partition, and for some reason on the board I wrote it incorrectly. Just for dramatic purposes, I need to make sure I pulled the book out, right? It's, it's always important to make sure you get your definitions right. So I'm going to put it on the screen here. So, so if I give you a finite or infinite collection of non-empty sets, so this is just a set with other sets in it and I'm going to call them A1, A2, and so on. So this is just a set with sets in it, a uh, collection. We call it a partition of the set A if and only if two properties hold. So the first property is that if I take the union of all of these elements that are in my collection, so A1, A2, there might be an A3, there might be an A4, I take the union of all of them, I get A. However, it must also be, so there's, that's part number one. Part number two is just that each one of these sets that's in the collection must be pairwise disjoint. Anyways, pass Dan, take it away. So, so and it's pairwise disjoint. So I want to give you an example, something you've seen before. Let the set E be equal to the set, the set of integers where I give N the name for the integer such that N is equal to 2K or some integer K and O, O is going to be the set that is it's a set of integers such that n is going to be equal to 2k plus 1 for some integer k. So, I want to ask you a question. Is Is the set E comma O a partition a partition of the set of integers? The answer, believe it or not, is actually yes. moment you realize very quickly that hey look that's the definition for even numbers that's the definition for odd numbers and I gave you a theorem that tells you that every integer is can be represented as either one or the other it's called the quotient remainder theorem right so remember I drew this picture at some point in the past but I didn't really give it much of, of a name or anything So if I drew E in a region, and I drew O in a region, you'll notice that if I give you 
the set of all integers, if this is the set that is all of this, you'll notice that E and O will partition the set of all integers. Some of them will be in here, some will be in there, but none will be left out, which is meaning that, yes, this is a partition of the set of integers. So I'm going to describe what is called the power set. So this is denoted as fancy P of A, given some set A. It is the set of all subsets of Seems pretty straightforward. So for example, if I give you A is the set 1, comma 2, where I just so I just have a set with two elements in it. The power set of A is just going to be equal to the empty set, which is indeed a subset of any other set, right? It has no elements in it. So we have to put it in there. So the empty set. 1, because 1 is a subset of 1, comma 2 there. 2 is indeed, right? But likewise, the set itself is a subset of the set, right? So power set would be four elements like this. And as a last note, as a last note, if the cardinality of A is equal to N, so just imagine I have some N, where N, this is the number of elements of A, right? So I have two elements here, for example. Then the cardinality of the power set of A is going to be equal to 2 to the power of n. So, that being said, we're going to stop right here. I say thank you very much, and have yourself a beautiful day.